Good evening. My name is Dave Burns, and uh, I'm the Story Center Publication Manager, and we're just so excited to have you here with us this evening for the State of Stories Poetry Anthology Book Launch. Um, we're doing something a little bit different. We have a number of panelists on here. We're also utilizing a Zoom webinar. So we thank you for being patient with us as we as we uh, get started with this. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, we'll encourage you to utilize the chat. You're welcome to chat with each other um, throughout the program. And we'll probably be putting some links in there uh, throughout and some information in there. But if you do have any questions for the panelists, I will ask that you use the Q&A feature. So go ahead and uh, if you wanna type in any questions you have, utilize the Q&A feature. We will have a Q&A towards the end and that'll just help us make sure we can get to everybody's questions or as many as possible that we have here this evening. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just get started quickly with some introduction information. Again, this is the State of Stories Poetry Anthology book launch, and we're just excited to have you here. This is a book that's published by Woodneath Press. Uh, we had over 300 submissions when we opened call for poets on both sides of the state line, and it was just, it's been an amazing turnout. Uh, so Curating Home, which is the title of of the anthology, which is also the theme that's been provided. We'll talk a little about that in, in a moment. Uh, Curating Home is a collection of poems by Kansas City metro area poets from both sides of the state line, fully representing poetry throughout Kansas City. Woodneath Press has published it as a part of the State of Stories programming developed by Mid-Continent Public Library, Story Center, and the University of Missouri's Extension Community Arts Program. The series of free public programs was created to commemorate the Missouri Bicentennial. As part of State of Stories, this anthology aims to provide a snapshot of Kansas City at a particular point in time from a variety of perspectives, all expressed in poetic form. Without the dedicated efforts of many, even a relatively modest project like this would not be possible. In particular, we want to thank the editors, Jose Faust, Marianne Kunkel, and Glenn North for their thorough readings and thoughtful discussions, William Trowbridge for his concise foreword, Amber Knoll for her perfect representation of the anthology's theme, Sherry Hall for providing the theme, the William T. Kemper Foundation Commerce Bank trustee for its financial support, and especially the poets who have provided us with new opportunities to appreciate and think about the lives and places in Kansas City and at this, for many reasons, very historic time. So thank you all so much for being a part of this process. Um, with that said, um, I am going to actually turn this over to our panelists. And we're going to start off with a question that I think might be a little loaded. Um, but why is poetry important? And I will ask that uh, when, you, when you share, if you would just introduce yourself, we'd appreciate that. Hi, everyone. I think I'll kick this off. Um, I'm Marianne Kunkel. I'm a professor of creative writing at Missouri Western State University in St. Joseph. I live here in Kansas City and love, love Kansas City. Um, I love the um, art scene and specifically how vibrant the, the poetry community is. And this was, I think, a real testament to that. So thank you, Dave. It was wonderful to work with you and for inviting me. And I'm so glad to have met Glenn through this. And Jose, I know, I think we'd crossed paths before this, but not, I feel like we've gone through a really wonderful experience and come out um, better friends. So um, in terms of uh, this question of why poetry is important and how it relates to the anthology, uh, I mean, I think this um, poetry has been important to me forever. Um, so it's hard for me to kind of step away and think about why poetry would be important in general. It's like asking, why do we need water to drink? <laughs> but, um, I think especially during the pandemic, um, thinking about the times that we were getting poems and looking at poems, um, it was, it's a way to connect across distance. Um, I know a lot of people have, use poetry as a way to stay close to friends during this time, um, passing poems back and forth, um, posting poems on, on their blog or on social media, um, and writing poems as a way to um, make sense of this time. Uh, so I think that was very apparent to me as Glenn and Jose and I were um, working and discussing the submissions to think about like the, the intimacy that we were able to feel even on Zoom, just reading through this work and um, honoring the musings that people are having in real time. So a lot of these poems, it was obvious, were kind of written um, or revised during this, this pandemic. Um, I'll also say, I've always said that I think there's nothing more democratic than writing. Um, I think 
you know, to have access to a pen and paper is, is pretty easy compared to a lot of things that um, are filtered through um, capitalism. And um, I think that, you know, that the idea of being able to draft something on your phone, I know a lot of parents who um, draft poems in the middle of the night while in bed with their their young children. Um, and so I think that too has always been something that I felt passionate about, just that um, you're entitled to uh, your witness of your experience um, through the act of writing a poem and that nobody can stop you from that. And that um, even if you're writing about exper an experience that was shared by others, they're they can write their own poem, right? So um, you're just, um, your only job is to to write your experience. Um, and I, I think that also has been in art in general um, and poetry because it's what I love, um, has been so valuable to me to think about how it's it takes very little to be able to um, sit down and do something so sacred. So I'd love to hear what the other panelists have to say. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for being with us. My name is Glenn North. I am the um, executive director of Bruce R. Watkins Cultural Heritage Center, and I am also a poet. And poetry, much like uh, Marianne uh, mentioned, has been a part of my life from the very beginning. My grandmother gave me a copy of the poem If by Rudyard Kipling when I was eight years old. She gave it to me for my eighth birthday, and I was not at all excited about that. I would have much rather have gotten uh, toys or, or um, you know, some of the things that she used to spoil me with. But on my eighth birthday, she gave me If. And... Um, if you haven't heard the poem, your homework assignment is to look it up, but uh, the opening stanza is, uh, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too, if you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. And it continues on with all of these incredible words of wisdom. Um, and the, the final line says, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, then yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. And so she challenged me to memorize the poem and to live out the philosophy that was communicated in the poem. And I did that. And I remember being so proud that I was able to recite the poem back to her only a few days after she had given it to me. And although I didn't fully understand it, um, I went on uh, shortly thereafter to start writing my own poems. And I've been writing ever since. Um, of course, later I found out that... Uh, Rudyard Kipling, who wrote If, was a horrible racist and colonizer, um, but um, the way I choose to look at it is that he inadvertently and posthumously gifted me uh, with a tool to combat his racist ideologies. And so for me, uh, poetry is important because it has been a vehicle by which um, I can express my thoughts and, and, and pursue um, social justice. I'm a student of the Harlem Renaissance and the Black Arts Movement. So when we think about the Harlem Renaissance and Langston Hughes and County Cullen and Claude McKay um, and Georgia Douglas, um, you know, during that time in the 1920s, there was this cultural revolution taking place in Harlem and Black artists were really trying to communicate to America and the world in general that, that we are worthy of being considered human, right? Um, we were having this discussion the day after the verdict um, was uh, delivered uh, as it pertains to Derek Chauvin's murder of George Floyd. And I'm so grateful um, that uh, the verdict was guilty. Uh, but the reason that that happened uh, in terms of Derek Chauvin feeling so comfortable taking George Floyd's life is that there are still people who don't view black people, indigenous people, people of color, or people who are different from them sometimes as human beings. And so the Harlem Renaissance showed that these black artists were capable of producing high art. And the thought was that by doing that, uh, the world would recognize um, their humanity. And then the Harlem, I'm sorry, the uh, Black Arts Movement with, with folks like uh, Amiri Baraka and, and uh, Sonia Sanchez and Nikki Giovanni, um, you know, they said, you know what, um, 
we are human and we are tired of being treated otherwise. And so the aesthetic uh, during the Black Arts Movement was really uh, resistant to the white gaze. You know, we will create our own beauty on our own terms and we will speak in revolutionary uh, and uh, in terms of revolution and, and try to move towards real social change, right? Um, and so all of that writing has inspired me. Um, Poetry has given me also an opportunity to work with young people. And I've seen the impact it has when young people discover their voice, um, when they're given opportunities to, to share poetry um, or spoken word when they're able to perform the, the way that it builds their confidence. Um, when we look at uh, recently uh, Amanda Gorman at the inauguration um, and the impact that that has had on uh, America, like there was a shift <laughs> that took place in those two minutes that she read that poem. I mean, I think that it demonstrates the power of poetry to capture emotions, uh, to document history, uh, to, to do what sometimes speeches and, and data and research can't do. You know, um, all of those things are important, but when a poem touches your heart, um, it can change your perspective. It can make you see the world differently. And I think that those are some of the reasons why poetry is so important. I do appreciate, um, you know, art for art's sake. You know, there are some poems that are beautifully written about daffodils and sunsets. And I think all of that is awesome. But for me, um, the ability to convey in a poem um, a way to challenge the status quo um, or to challenge someone's thinking um, is, is really electric. Um, and I love it when um, I've shared a poem and a random person comes up to me and says, hey, I didn't even think I liked poetry, but you know, what I heard from you just made me think that maybe I do, you know? <laughs> so um, it's just been, uh, for me, uh, a way to, in some, you know, I think we're all given the challenge of, you know, you can't necessarily change the world, but in your sphere of influence, you can have an impact. And poetry is what God has given me. And that's um, the tool that I try to use to, to make things better. And Jose, uh, if you will bring it on home in the way only you can. <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, I'm driving a ship blindly, right? Uh, poetry for me is, um, I really don't know when I ended up loving poetry, but I knew at a very early age I talked in poetry. Um, some things I would say, uh, aunts or uncles would say, oh my God, you know, and I would never remember what I had said, of course. Uh, but I think the one real first to preach, oh, my name is Jose Faust, by the way. I'm an artist, performer, um, uh, painter here in Kansas City, involved in community. Um, but I was saying, I think one of the first, when I think about mentors that I ever had in my life, was a guy, um, in Bo I was in Boys Town, Nebraska, Father Flanagan's boys home for about three and a half years. Um, I was 11, 12, when I took his class, actually. Uh, it was Mr. Boston. And he was this very frail man. I mean, he looked frail to me. He was very thin. Uh, his clothes kind of hung on him. He wasn't tall. He was small. Had glasses and uh, receding hairline. Um, uh, and he spoke very softly. But I remember he changed on me one day. We started a poetry section. And he, uh, he read uh, Dylan Thomas to us. Uh, he read Fern Hill. And he became that poem. I mean, literally, his language was that poem. And I, I love Fern Hill. It's one of my uh, favorite poems. And I try to read it, I think, the way I heard him read it to me many, 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 many decades ago. <laughs> um, but I think that was like the biggest inspiration for me, that poem. And, but also just to see the transformation that went through when he took those words as his own. Um, and I think I've always found in, I think uh, Marianne Pitt put it really well, a certain democracy in poetry, specifically literature, of course, but there's a democracy in poetry because everybody I know writes poetry. 
I challenge people sometimes, they'll say, oh, I don't write poetry. Nah, it's not for me. But I'll ask a kid, I said, have you ever written a note to a girl in class? Oh, yeah, that's poetry. <laughs> uh, some girl will go, have you ever read a poem, a, a, a note that somebody wrote you? Yeah, and you wrote back, that's poetry, right? It's that form of engaging with, with us in this very short, sometimes very short, direct things. But it's also a language that um, comes from very deep within us, right? I, I, I'm convinced the first thing we do as humans is that gasp that comes as we come out of the womb, right? And the last thing we do as humans is that gasp when we die. I've seen both of those, honestly. And I think they are poetry. And everywhere in between is poetry trying to come out from us. A lot of us walk away from it as we grow older. But I think Glenn said it sometimes, um, the power of it to move people who convince themselves that they don't like poetry. I've had that same experience. Dude, I did not think I liked poetry, but damn, maybe there's something I should check out. I, I sometimes tell them, well, don't expect them to read the way I read or the way Glenn reads, because some people murder the poem in the way they read it, right? But that's that's neither, neither here nor there. But poetry is essential in that way. And I'm, I've always been grateful that in my life, um, people haven't laughed when I told them I was a poet. As a matter of fact, I remember telling somebody one time, an old man, Fred White, that was my neighbor, he asked me what I wanted to do, what I wanted to be when I was 18 years old. I just moved into the neighborhood in Westport. And I told him, I said, hey, I want to be a poet. I just, honestly, I didn't know why the hell I said that. It was the first thing that came to mind. But he, he looked at me there in the eye and he says, you know, Jose, actually Joe, because I was not Jose then. <laughs> he said, Joe, there's only one poet that ever made a living that I know of, and his name was Robert Frost, and he's dead. <laughs> well, maybe I'm in the right field then. <laughs> I don't expect to make a lot of money, uh, but the rewards you get from poetry are incalculable. And I think they've come through in this pandemic, made a lot of connections with a lot of people across the city and across the country and even internationally through poetry, through hearing others' poetry, sharing my own. Uh, and just jumping in into a Zoom meeting, uh, Buddha would have thought that this would be the medium that would um, at least fill in a lot of gaps for me. So um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity, and I think this anthology shows you why poetry is important, at least in this moment as well, in Kansas City's history. So there. <laughs> that, that was amazing, all of you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think... Uh, I think there's obviously something about this right now because we had, we've had such an outpouring of people wanting to be a part of this project. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, kind of moving forward, as you're reading through these poems, you identified a theme of curating home. And so I'm going to take a few minutes and talk about um, kind of where that theme came from. And then we have Amber Knoll, who's the cover designer and Sherry Purpose Hall, who actually wrote the poem that inspired uh, that theme. So um if you all would talk a little bit about that, and then Amber, if you want to talk about how you um, came about that cover design, and then Sherry, if you'd be willing to read that poem, we would that'd be wonderful. Yeah. Hi, I'm I'm Amber Knoll. I'm a digital designer for AN Graphic Design. Um, I've worked with Story Center on some other projects. So um, first of all, I think I had the easiest part possible of this whole process, just because. From all these submissions, I don't know how you you were able to just get this wonderful collection, but I want to thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. I've, I've, I'm, I'm honored. Thank you. So um, whenever David came to me and um, and told me about the subject and, and, and as I gathered more information about it, to me, the imagery that kept coming into my mind was, you know, whenever I think of curating, I think of art that you would like a collection of paintings and things like that. And I realized that this is the curation of voices really. And um, to me, the imagery that just kept on coming to me was that this is basically like ripples in a pond that start and then it just kind of starts to make a wave. And to me, these voices, this collection of voices are, are the foundation of our home basically is, is, is what I was trying to literally get across on the cover. So that's, that's kind of where my mindset was and where, I, where I kind of went with it. I know we're, we're landlocked here in Kansas city. So it was kind of odd to have like a, almost like a water theme here, but, but yeah, that was just what kept coming back to my mind. So that's where, that's where that came from. So. Great. Thank you, Amber. And um, 
any of the editors, would you like to talk a little bit about how you came up with that theme? And then we'll have Sherry read, read the poem. Put anybody on the spot, Marianne, you got it? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, I remember we had a meeting about the title and I had pulled out some phrases that I liked as kind of a starting point to say, you know, this would be, these are phrases that for me are kind of zinging off the page. And I thought we would take those phrases and then kind of build something from that, that were our own words. And when I suggested, when I just said the words curating home, I think all of us thought, there's no improvement on that. Like that's, that's it. Um, and I think Jose was the one who said, all right, this is what we send Dave curating home. Um, and so thank you to Sherry. I, I keep thinking of those two words and just how they, they represent place, but also the, the artistic tradition of, of curation and kind of the control and the craft that goes into making a place a home. Um, and that was all her. <laughs> For sure. I, I remember I remember that conversation and we were really um, giving a lot of thought and conversation around what would the theme be and ultimately what would the title be. But, you know, the impetus was right. The the bicentennial of Missouri and we wanted to, to keep it local in terms of, you know, Kansas City poets or at least the greater Kansas City area. and. Um, so home, you know, during the pandemic <laughs> became uh, a very, you know, what is actually happening in my home and what does home mean? Uh, the, the importance of home was uh, definitely reinforced by having to stay at home um, during the pandemic. And I also think there was also all of the racial unrest and the racial tension and, you know, what, what is America, right? What, who are we really is? And, and so America as our home, and there are these catchphrases that we use in terms of, uh, you know, like diversity and inclusion and equity and social justice and all of these terms are important, but ultimately it's really about feeling like you belong, right? And, and where do you most belong or where do you feel, you know, most that, that, that you're welcome? And that's, that's in your home. And how do, you, how do you make your home a place that people feel welcome and, and feel like they belong? And I think in a lot of the poems that we saw, um, even if that wasn't the, the theme overtly, um, there was just this kind of underlying thing that was happening in terms of what home means and how do you make a place a home. And um, so Sherry's poem just hit that so squarely on the head that um, when when Marianne mentioned it, it was like, oh, finally, now we got it. <laughs> yeah. I would, I would only add that it was... Uh... It felt like a smorgasbord you come at. So when Glenn is talking about, even though the theme may not have been directly that, it's like that buffet line you go to and you see those vegetables that you never eat, but you go, oh, they threw butter on them. I'll give it a shot. <laughs> so it's kind of like tasting all these different things. And that poem, the, the anthology really covers all that. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. And Sherry, this theme would not be, um, would be here without your work. So, uh, if you'd be willing to maybe introduce yourself and uh, read the poem that inspired that, we would love to hear that. Absolutely. Um, my name is Sherry Purpose Hall. I am a spoken word artist, um, also executive director of Poetry for Personal Power, um, among other things. And um, I'm a part of this community. So I'm, I'm really um, honored that you would choose Curating Home uh, to title the book, especially because of how, what it means to, um, be black in America, that our artifacts, we, we don't have a lot of us, the built up wealth, the passed down things, but what we do is hide things in plain sight. We keep our grandmother's artifacts. So, um, with that being said, 
Um, this poem is called Turned Tables. Mama taught me preservation, how to care for mud deer, how to keep ancestors in harmony, how to band and conduct the score, the art of keeping home. Pillows fluffed and blood wiped up, sweat cleaned and crumbs removed, evaporated tears in the sacred corners of her pristine, keep her close, never discard, no nursing home, no landfill rots, never give her away for someone else's wares, treasure her. Mama taught me reverence. I find comfort in mud deer's lap. Smells of joy in working hands. I sit placing my arm on hers, held like the little girl I once was. Her skin whispers a familiar familial melody. A combo of blues and swing, culture-soaked tapestry and flyness on warm, light-flooded walls. Her record spinning a sound of Jim Crow survival. Big band, number running, Bible thumping, moon shining, funk ballads and trap, a symphony orchestrated ca classically, combining sounds old and new, constructed for lasting wisdom, speaking the tune of the ages. Mama's generation found a new way to scratch tables without ruining legacy. Marks a revolving irrit break beat, irrit break beat. Her heart beats in the breakdown. Mama taught me love with skilled scratch and smooth horn while cleaning. Mud deer taught history on wooden floors, furnishing the householding descendants. We own, we keep, we kept. We care, we pass down, we inherit, we no longer own our hip hop or jazz, but we own these artifacts. We retain these spirit filled things. She holds the groceries, then we use her recipes, eats in the good chair as she watches over us secured on high. We protect her, we protect blackness, African Americana. We protect them from the hands that seek to steal, destroy, appropriate. Mama taught me concealment, how to trick them, how to hide and protect our history, how to keep a vault of exhibits, the art of curating home. That was amazing, Sherry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so what I've asked uh, the, the panelists to do now is I wish we had time for everyone to be able to share all the poems that were included, but we just, we, we have so many that we just can't quite pull that off. But what would be a poetry book launch without having, hearing some poetry in addition to what Sherry just shared with us? So I've asked the, um, the editors to select a couple poems uh, read them and just talk a little bit about why they selected those specific ones. So um, I will open the floor up. Okay, I will kick it off since Marianne started the conversation. Um, the two poems I chose, well, let me just start with one, right? So the first one um, is called All the West Side Girls Love Lou Diamond Phillips. It's by Lauren Sharhag. And that poem really resonated with me um, because it, I'll read it first, right? And then I'll explain why it resonated with me. How about that? All right. All the West Side Girls Love Lou Diamond Phillips. <clears throat> Summer of 88 and La Bamba was released on VHS. Us West Side kids had found our idol. Before that, we got excited whenever Speedy Gonzalez appeared on our TV screens. There was an old Chevy Chase film my mother loved mostly for the sassy Mexican cook with whom she shared a name, Aurora. And we loved anything with Cheech Marin. If there were other bits of Mexico and pop culture at the time, I'm hard pressed to think of them. Desi Arnaz was Cuban, also black and white. No, thank you. But we held them in our hearts like talismans. Mexicans were still exotic back then in the way that Italians were exotic in 1905. My friends didn't know what a tamal was. When they came to dinner, they tried to eat it husk and all. The only Mexican restaurants in town served tacos and store-bought shells, and everything came in a side 
with a side of refried bean puree smothered in white cheese that was like a mockery of queso fresco. But suddenly, everyone knew the song La Bamba. They played it everywhere, at the supermarket, at school dances, and even the white girls agreed. Lou Diamond Phillips was so cute. He wasn't even Latino, but we loved him anyway. My tío made bootleg copies for everyone, and we watched it over and over. We knew all the songs, every dance move. We reenacted them on our front porch using a broom as a guitar, a hairbrush as a microphone. We were amazed that someone could sing in Spanish and sound cool. None of the warbling ballads or cheesy corridos heavy on the accordion that we knew from our Abuelas records. We girls started wearing our hair in high 1950s ponytails tied with big bows. Our Catholic school saddle Oxfords were suddenly stylish. The boys either combed their hair into pompadours or wanted black leather jackets like Bob. Now, 30 years later, my cousin still thinks he's Isa Morales roaring around on his motorcycle. And I can't hear sleepwalk without getting choked up. Stand and Deliver came out that same year, but a math teacher isn't nearly as sexy. And we had to wait 10 years for Selena, for Jennifer Lopez to come with her Naglas, Nalgas, I'm sorry, and Spangled Bras. Also not actual Mexican, not also not an actual Mexican, but we will take what we can get. I'm sorry I murdered those last couple of lines, but <laughs> the poem is awesome. So don't hold that against the poem. But it resonated with me in that um, some of my childhood memories, like before my parents split up, were us going to see like Shaft and Superfly um, at the drive-in and just how happy we were um, to see representation, uh, to see people who look like us, you know, on the big screen. I remember, you know, Good Times in the Jeffersons um, and us just crowding around the TV and in school the next day, all of us uh, reciting lines that either uh, JJ had said or how much we loved Thelma because she was so cute and had such a great body. Um, but anyway, <laughs> that poem just reminded me of how important representation is. And it was my lived experience, but it was also an experience coming from someone who has a different background and ethnicity, but who you know, was experiencing something that was very similar to what I experienced. And, you know, it also had that kind of uh, feminine perspective. Uh, but I know, like I just said, like how much all of the guys, like we all had a crush on Thelma, you know, growing up, we all had a crush on Thel uh, um, Janet Jackson. And so um, it has this, the, the poem to me had this kind of undercurrent of, you know, a push uh, to be recognized and represented, uh, but also just kind of this, the joy of just being young, right? And and what is fun and what you think is cool when you're a young person. So that one really spoke to me. And then the second one I would like to read is a little more somber. Um, and it's called Vigil. And it uh, is a poem that was written by Lindy, Lindsay Weiser. <clears throat> Moon, a bright eye tooth, night, a freckling of stars, sidewalks overgrown, glittered with glass. Glass beads catch street lamps as the little brothers and sisters lead us by candlelight across busy streets long past their signal through darkened neighborhoods where figures have gathered on porches and in the streets to listen to Hail Marys that alternate English and Spanish. Up the road, the red, white, and blue pulse of police. Two nights ago on 10th Street, four people died in a bar by bullet. Tonight, the sisters and brothers pray through a microphone, repeating scripture, repeating wounded, I will never cease to love, into unlighted streets, fingering the joyful mysteries of a rosary caught like a kite in the trees. Can there ever be joy again? Light, when it leaves the eyes of a beloved, the sisters and brothers hand their neighbors candles, a homeless man, a woman, and her young daughter, 
baptism of wax and flame. Not all will be dark. The chill of the evening seeps through the seams of our clothes at a grotto with the painting of Maria in bright red. Under her, a small leafless tree in its branches, a red cardinal. The prayers return dark to its silence here. Candles return night to its stars. And, um, you know, poetry taken from the headlines. Um, you know, there was a, that incident, uh, not, I don't even want to use that word, but there was a mass shooting um, in Kansas City, Kansas, and uh, many thought that, you know, I don't know. But, but with, with, with vigils, which I've seen many um, over the past several years, you know, it's, I don't, I don't want to diminish the importance of them, but it can sometimes be like, you know, our thoughts and prayers are with you, like in a horrific moment, you know, words can sometimes come up so short. And so I think what the poet did in this instance was just painting the picture so simply and so vividly um, that real emotion resonated um, in a way um, that is really hard to capture with something that is so serious. Um, and the way, like the first line, she didn't say, and the moon looked like a bright eye tooth in the sky that night. You know, she very concisely said moon, a bright eye tooth, night, a freckling of stars. And so it's like these, like it's so like these incredible visual images um, with such a depth of emotion um, that just really resonated with me. That I, I'm just continually, um, yeah, impacted by that poem every time I read it. I guess I'll go so, next, unless Marianne wants to fight me for it. <laughs> um, go for it. So I want to pick, I, I pick two poems. What I'll do is I'll read them first, and then uh, I, I'll read one and then talk a little bit about it. This is Baba Yaga bought the house already like that, or I thought this would be different, by Aaron Adair Hodges. The forest offered few options. This thicket hulks so black, Sunlight's a rumor among mushrooms. Everything quiver its little prayer with not enough gods to hear. I hear. Poppy seeds shriek from the soil to be seen, to be known, as the mortar wants the plunge of the pestle. I'd nursed other plants, sent instead on missions by maybe mothers for fire and into the fire. To marry, to mother a little death, there was something else I'd meant to do with that broom. You enter the woods one way, but are not the same when you leave it, if you leave it. Listen, what is a house but a thing that waits, married to the earth, waiting gnarls a bone? This house, it wants to run. So looking at the poem, at the, it's capitalized Baba Yaga. And I thought, okay, that's gotta be something. So I went and looked up Baba Yaga. And it's actually, I read what the description is on Wikipedia, our international source of everything. Uh, Baba Yaga is a supernatural being. It comes from a Slavic folklore. Um, it's either a supernatural being or a trio of sisters of the same name who appears as a deformed or ferocious looking old woman. In Slav Slavic culture, Baba Yaga lived in a hut usually described as standing on chicken legs. And I don't really, you can read the whole thing, there's a lot in there, but there's some lines that just literally just kick my butt. Um, and I'll, there's the one that, that really gets me right off the bat is everything quivers its little prayer with not enough gods to hear. I hear that identification. We are gods, right? Immediately. That's like a literal thing, but it's like kind of creeps in on you. not even thinking about it. Um, I like the idea of the mortar once the plunge of the pestle, right? The, the need, the thing has a function, but it serves none. If the pestle isn't doing its grinding. Um, and then it goes right into this idea about nursing other plants. Uh, it's said, sent instead on missions by maybe mothers for fire and into the fire. I just imagine this um, being being asked to do other things than what it really has a purpose for. And then there's the, the, the one line that really just kicks me, to marry, 
to mother a little death. Um, the idea of birth is always really the beginning of our death. Um, that's an image and a theme that I've always, I think a lot about. Um, and then I like the one line, you enter the woods one way, but not the same when you leave it. Um, so I won't say more about that poem, but it's, it's, it just conjures so many different places that I can go. Um, but in that line too, the sunlight's a rumor among mushrooms. Mushrooms are happy. They don't need a lot of sun, right? Uh, the other one I read is uh, Investigations by Jordan Templeman. Unpleasant facts are what it feels like to be crowded by nothing but you. Unpleasant facts seem less about the snow cover, less about what was there before the snow came down, everything about the melted wash merge of the thereafter. Unpleasant facts say what we will look like in 25 years. Unpleasant facts play constantly in their own shadows. Unpleasant facts salt the imagination before drowning it. Unpleasant facts begin as glitter and end with a blowtorch. Unpleasant facts catch in the throat in the long moment before they're believed. Unpleasant facts usually steer clear of most sexual encounters, returning to highways, hospitals, and nations under threat. Unpleasant facts refer to you as seagull mouth, an after image with a bang. Unpleasant facts are not the name for unpleasant facts. Unpleasant facts don't care. Uh, I love the way it, it resolves to that last line. Unpleasant facts don't care, right? Uh, but there's just something really nice about this when you start thinking about unpleasant facts. And he leads you and takes you through a discourse about what they are. But the images that open up, it's just like, uh, I love that line. Unpleasant facts seem less about the snow cover, less about what was there before the snow came down everything about the melted wash merch of the thereafter and there is something that happens when snow comes right it's that the unpleasantness for me because i hate snow um and i hate winter uh but there's a moment where it captures me there's the the cast the light comes down there's the blue that hangs on the fresh snow but then when it's gone damn it <laughs> the wash merch of the thereafter so it's a nice i love the things that the poem does for me and now to you, Maria. Thank you. Um, I selected two poems. Uh, one is A Summer Day by Hesham Cook. And uh, I love this poem. It's long and it's um, kind of full. Um, and it, it has that nature of kind of being one complete thought. Um, and it, ta it brings up um, the crisis at the border with um, immigrants and asylum seekers, it brings up COVID-19. And I picked it because I've been thinking about um, the Derek Chauvin trial yesterday and just the ways that we try to write as poets about the present day. Um, I got the news about the verdict at gymnastics class with my five-year-old um, and another mother in the lobby told me the news and we drove home and my five-year-old who is too curious, had heard me talking about it and wanted to know more of what was going on. And um, I, we talked and we talked and I asked if he had more questions and I don't know if I got it right. I think um, one of the things, another reason that poetry is so important is that um, it can serve to refine or clarify thoughts. Um, but I think it's, it's so important to bring our present day and to bring um, to, to see protest as one of the ways that poetry can function. Um, and I just love how fluidly she does this in this poem. A summer day. The kids are playing in the backyard pool. My son, six in the shallow end, diving for little hoops. My daughter, four, holding onto the steps, blowing bubbles and kicking, both covered head to toe, sunscreen and white streaks across their faces and ears and necks soft and skinny, the brownest part of them despite the many applications. And I marvel that such a slender thing can hold up their heavy heads. In anatomical drawing, the ideal figure has a head to body ratio of one to eight, but, but a toddler's is about one to five. And now I am thinking of my son as a newborn, my fear that if I didn't support his head just right, hand gripping gently yet firmly against the base of his skull, his neck might snap. I know now that little ones are tougher than I thought that my child, 
can fall out of a shopping cart head first onto concrete and be fine, that a child can sleep uninterrupted after a possible concussion, that their fevers run high, that brain damage doesn't occur until reaching 108 degrees Fahrenheit. But I also know that drowning doesn't look like drowning. A drowning person cannot wave their arms, but instead extends them laterally, pressing down, their mouth bobbing in and out of the water as they struggle to breathe. I know that it takes a single unguarded moment for a child to slip beneath the surface beyond notice. I can't help but recall the image of Alan Curdy, his little toddler body lying face down at the beach as if asleep, his wet red shirt rucked up above his waist. And seeing it, I wanted to pull it down and cover the soft skin of his belly, the way I do for my sleeping children because a bare tummy might make them sick. I know that immigrants and asylum seekers are dying in and shortly after detention, like Marie Juarez, not even two years old, who caught a respiratory infection at a center in Texas and ran a fever of over 104 degrees. When my own child's fever passed 104, despite cool compresses and dosing with acetaminophen and ibuprofen, we stripped down for skin to skin, which can help regulate body temperature. And I felt like a bad thing rocking my child, feeling that limp body burn like a brand between my breasts for hours before the fever finally broke. But Marie grew sicker. And after release from detention, she died in a hospital from viral pneumonitis. We can't know if she'd have lived if she hadn't been detained, but we do know her mother Yasmin sent her daughter's body alone back to Guatemala to be buried with her relatives. I know thousands of detainees have tested positive for COVID-19. I know children who arrived without a parent or legal guardian have been held at Fort Sill, home to the Army's main artillery school, now designated as an emergency shelter, once a Japanese internment camp, or more precisely, as Lawson Fusawanada writes, described by the War Relocation Authority as camps or centers for assembly, concentration, detention, evacuation, internment, relocation, among others. And earlier still, the place Geronimo and the other Chiriqua Apache were held 20 years in violation of their terms of surrender. And here I am, sitting in the shade of a magnolia, watching my children scream in delight, not drowning, the sun gleaming on the water and their upturned faces, the August heat a benediction rather than a scourge. And I wonder, what more should I be doing with this one life? Um, I'm just going to leave that. I think it speaks for itself. <laughs> um, uh, the last poem, uh, I think I saw Hadara Barnadoff is here and I want to read one of her poems. Um, uh, it's a poem that every once in a while I run into a poem and I'm like, oh, you can do that. I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I think that's just a poet's process to, as Ezra Pound said, make it new, right. And to keep, um, kind of experimenting with language and touching people, um, in, in new ways with words. Um, so this is a poem that uses a word um, over and over until I think it's almost at its breaking point and that becomes um, kind of the, the, the beauty of the poem. When M becomes a tree, M texted the word bliss three times before she died. Her last intelligible word. She was being eaten from the inside her lungs, bones, lymph nodes, her brain. Tumors raiding her language and memory, uncentering her centers, so all she had was bliss. The forests were on fire, and this was bliss. Her husband and daughter cried at her bedside, and this was also bliss. And the dog refused to leave her room, bliss. Even with an oxygen machine breathing for her, bliss, and her vast list of opioids, bliss. Paralyzed in a bed in her living room, bliss. Where she could see her beloved dogwood, bliss. Loss of speech, bliss. Moaning, bliss. Up and out into the petaled softness of a tree. Wow, those were all so... So wonderful. I've had the opportunity to read them before, but thank you all for 
um, bringing those anew for me. I know a lot of these, for a lot of folks, this is the first time they've heard those poems, but uh, having you all hear them or read them um, made them brand new for me. So thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> as I uh, mentioned previously, uh, we are going to open things up for Q&A. So if you have any questions, please send them through the Q&A aspect. Um, we'll go ahead and and start, start getting some of those out. Um, but before we do, I know some folks had questions about where to, to get a copy of this amazing anthology. And we've partnered with a, um, a company called Ingram Spark out of Nashville. And essentially, uh, this book is available on Amazon and everywhere books are sold in paperback and ebook format. The paperback is $6.99. The ebook is $4.99. We tried to make it um, as affordable as possible. So hopefully we can get this into as many hands as possible. So if you haven't had a chance to grab a copy, please feel free to do so, as well as uh, we have copies in the Mid-Continent Public Library system. So we've got some paperbacks and ebooks as well. So hopefully you can get, a, get your hands on a copy of this and, uh, and read all the amazing poems that we didn't get a chance to, uh, to share this evening. Uh, so if, again, if you have any questions, feel free to, to chat them in. Um, via the Q&A, and uh, while, while I review that, I'm going to just open up the floor to the panelists, and um, if there's anything you didn't have a chance to share, uh, feel free to take a few moments and share, and I'll look and see if we have any, any questions from the audience. Um, I would just say that everyone should have an opportunity to edit an anthology. Um, <laughs> the, the, the kind of conversations that you can have around poems and the discussion behind like why uh, one of us would advocate for a certain poem or one of us, you know, um, not to be Debbie Downer, but might not have thought a poem rose to the occasion um, is, is just an incredible learning experience, but the kind of conversations that reading uh, a broad range of poetry can, can bring about is, is really cool. So, um, you know, there are a lot of book clubs, but I don't know, at least I'm not aware of any poetry specific book clubs locally, but it would be cool if uh, folks had a discussion group um, around or a book club, you know, a book discussion around um, curating home because there's um, so many valuable conversations that you can have with poetry as a focal point. Great. Thank you for sharing that, Glenn. Uh, we've had a few questions pop in. Uh, so the first one uh, from Tina asking how many poems were sent in and how many were published and then the following ones, how many were included in the book. Um, I can speak a little bit to that. Uh, we had over 300 poems submitted during the two-month window that it was open, uh, July and August, um, which I was I was amazed at the number of poems that we had in uh, from both sides of the state line. I thought it was a really good representation of uh, Kansas City as a metro area. Um, of those, we had, let's see, 34 poets are included, and we have 44 poems in the anthology. Uh, which I, again I think is a really good um, a good mix of what we had. Um, we had another question from Phyllis ask, "What are some examples of how the poems depicted this region?" Anyone like to take that? Yeah, so that was. Uh, go ahead, Jose. I'm sorry. I was just going to say... actually jump on yours, the one that uh, about uh, West Side Girls, right? <laughs> like mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. the Diamond Phillips, like. They were specifically of a place and time, a neighborhood. I think there was one about uh, something. I think Phil, as you wrote it, the one about uh, the Nelson, um, if I can recall. Mm. So they were some were very much particularly about a specific place, uh, new arrivals, something like that. Uh, others were memories. Um, even the one that I read about Baba Yaga, I mean, that could be any of the woods that are around here in Kansas City, right? This is a very forested area. So I could, I didn't have to stretch far to make them relevant to this experience. Yeah, I was just going to say that that was one of my um, kind of guiding principles in terms of, you know, above and beyond, you know, the aesthetic um, and other things that we look for that 
make a poem a good poem um, that, you know, requires nego- negotiation was what poems really gave us a, a real sense of place. And uh, there were poems like um, Guide to the Flint Hills, Bone, um, Guide to the Flint Hills by Susan Carmen, Bone by Greg Field, um, Give Me All That Jazz by Robert Hill, which is a really fun poem. Um, First Anniversary in Kansas City. Um, So we definitely wanted to, and that was by, I'm sorry, Marsha Herlow. So we just wanted to, at least for me, it was important that if somebody in Connecticut got their hands on a copy of Curating Home, that they would have a real sense of place as it pertains to Missouri, Kansas City, and kind of the Midwest um, in general. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, any other thoughts on that question? Those are some great, great answers. All right, wonderful. Uh, so we had another question um, asking about if there's gonna be any other events associated with this publication. And I know we've talked a little bit about that. Um, obviously the, the virtual world that we live in make things may make things a little bit challenging, but um, that's definitely something that we're, that we had planned for previously and we're kind of looking forward to see how that might happen. So keep your eyes peeled and uh, hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to provide some future, future programming in junction, conjunction with the poetry. So thank you for asking that. A virtual book discussion, get, de, um, Dave, I think would be great <laughs> and pretty yeah. simple to pull off. You know what I mean? You wouldn't have to pay someone an honorary <laughs> for that. That's true, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, this would be an amazing book to do a book discussion on, wouldn't it? Oh, my goodness. It could go on forever with just digging into each one of the poems. That's fantastic. Uh, let's see. I know we've got a few minutes left. Um if you have any other questions, please feel free to, to chat them in. Uh, I have placed in the chat uh, a link to our program survey, our online program survey. So if you'd be willing to fill that out, we'd greatly appreciate it. Just let us know how you enjoyed this event. Um, again, here's a cover of Curating Home done by Amber Knoll. And it is just beautiful, Amber. You've done a number of book covers for us. And this, this might be your best work. So well done on that. Um, and I just want to take a moment and thank uh, Sherry Purpose Hall for reading and for providing us with the theme again. Um, Marianne Kunkel, Jose Faust, Glenn North for, for reading through all those submissions and for giving us something that I think we can all really be proud of and really represents um, not only Kansas City, but the world we find ourselves in right now. So thank you for that, for all your hard work on that. Uh, last call, I'm going to check and see if we have any other questions. Um, not at the moment, I think, unless anyone else has any, has any questions, I think we might be nearing the end here. Um, as we do, I'm going to open the floor one last moment and just see if anyone has any final thoughts, before, any of our panelists have any final thoughts before we, uh, before we close this event. Get you just a, a quick shout out to William Trowbridge for the forward. Thank you for coming through. I'd love to do this again in five years, 10 years, see how the conversation um, in the Kansas City poetry community evolves. So hint, hint, Dave. <laughs> hint taken, Marianne, thank you. And maybe, we can, <laughs> maybe we can pass the torch and have others um, edit and I would love to be a, a submitter too, but I just think it's, it's a really important um, representation of this place. That would be really cool to see how poetry has changed and possibly even stayed the same in five years. So great idea. Thank you. Um, One of my mentors, uh, A. Van Jordan, who is from uh, Cincinnati, just talked about how important it is for um, voices from the Midwest to uh, speak to who we are and to um, kind of give voice uh, to the middle of the map because we always hear so much from the East and the West Coast that it is really important um, for us to express who we are, especially through poetry. So um, this is one of the few anthologies that I think does that in a very profound way. Mm -hmm. I agree. Well, the next one, there's so many more poets that we can get in there. So hurry up. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's true i think we i think we learned a lot and uh 
there's just a lot of great poets sitting around waiting to waiting to shine their work. So wonderful. Well, again, I just want to thank our panelists this evening, Sherry Purpose Hall. Thank you, Amber Noel. Thank you, Marianne Kunkel, Jose Faust, Glenn North. Thank you, and again, thank you to William Trowbridge for providing the forward. And thank all of you poets for submitting your work and for being a part of this amazing project. Uh, it was a it was almost a year long project, but I think the final outcome is is something that we can all be very proud of. So I am. I am blessed to be a part of this, and I want to thank you all for helping me and be and allowing me to be a part of this project with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Yeah, shout out to Dave for making this happen. I am so sorry. Yeah, thank you, sir. Oh, no worries. No yeah. worries. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I hope everyone get a hand on a copy of Curating Home. If you have any questions, I'm going to put my email address in the chat. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy, happy to help. And I just want to thank you all again. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you so very much. <laughs>